Friends, our scripture readings this morning come from four different passages throughout scripture. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says, God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Psalm 145.13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises, and faithful in all he does. Joshua 21.45 says, Not one of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. And then finally, Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I hope that you noticed the common theme in our scripture passages this morning. God is faithful and God keeps his promises. This is something we see over and over throughout scripture. We see it in these verses and others like them, but we also see it in many of the stories we find throughout the Bible. If you think through some of the most famous stories of the Bible, you will notice God making and keeping promises. God keeps his promises to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Mary, to the 12 disciples, and many other figures throughout the Bible. The Bible is full of stories about God making and keeping promises. And I want to share a lesser known one of those stories with you this morning. And the story that I want to share with you from the Bible is a story about the Apostle Paul. And we've all heard about the Apostle Paul if we've been in church for any length of time. He's probably one of the most famous figures in the New Testament. And if you remember, his story starts, he was Saul, and Saul was not a very good person. But Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he became, he became Paul. And Paul spent the rest of his life telling people about God, telling people how much God loved them, organizing churches, and then writing letters to those churches throughout the rest of his life. And those letters end up making up a lot of what we read in our New Testament today. But the story that I want to tell you about Paul this morning comes way after after that story of Saul becoming Paul. But before I begin the story, I need to give you a little bit of context. Because about a week, two weeks, three weeks, somewhere in that range before this story starts, Paul was at his house, or at a house, praying one night before he was going to bed. And as he was praying, he had a vision from God. And God said this to him. God said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. That's in Acts 23, 11. In that moment, God made a promise to Paul. He said, just, if you, just as you have preached about me and taught about me in Jerusalem, you're going to teach about me and preach about me in Rome. All right, and so a couple of weeks pass, and Paul is in a city. He is telling people about God. He's telling people how much God loves them, and he is arrested in that city for doing that. And the people who arrested him, instead of putting him in the prison in that city, they decide they're going to send Paul all the way to Rome to plead his case before Caesar, the ruler of the Roman Empire. But the problem was this city is a long, long way from Rome. To walk that distance would have taken months and months and months. So instead they decide they're going to put Paul on a boat with a lot of other people and they're going to sail all the way to Rome. Now, I work with children here at the church, and I tell them this all the time, that if they ever build a time machine, if they ever create a time machine or find a time machine, and they go back to the time of the Bible, I have one piece of advice for them. Don't ever get on a boat. Because if you've noticed, almost every time there's a Bible story about people getting on the boat, a giant storm comes. And this story is no different. This story happens. Paul and these people, they're on the boat for a couple of days, and a giant storm comes. But this is probably the largest storm we have recorded in the Bible. They called it a northeaster. It lasted for 14 straight Days And the people on the boat are panicking. They're trying to make sure the boat doesn't tip over. They're scared to death that they are going to tip over and that they're all going to drown. Everyone on the boat begins to panic. Everyone except Paul. Paul never panics. Paul is a calm in the midst of the chaos. He's at peace in the midst of the storm. He begins to tell all the other passengers, we're going to be okay. We're all going to be all right. The boat is not going to flip over. We are not going to die. Why is Paul able to be calm in the midst of this giant storm when everyone around him is panicking? Because God has promised him that he will preach and teach in Rome. 
And Paul believes that God is faithful and that God keeps his promises. And Paul was right. They did not flip over. After 14 days, the boat crashes onto a sandbar right off the island of Malta. And so all the people on the boat, they have to get off the boat, stand on the sandbar, and then they have to swim the rest of the way to the island of Malta. So by the time they get to the island of Malta, they are exhausted, they are freezing, and they are soaking wet. And the people on Malta take pity on them, and they begin to build a giant bonfire on the beach to help these people that were shipwrecked warm up and have a place to rest and get dry. All right, so they start building the fire. They're gathering brush. They're gathering sticks, throwing it on the fire. And Paul sees what they're doing, and he decides to help. So he's picking up brush. He's picking up sticks. And after one time of picking something up and throwing it on the fire... After it has flown out of his hands, he looks, and there's something clinging to his hands. He's been bitten by a snake, and it's hanging on his hand. And Paul looks at it, and I'm I'm assuming he flicked it off, or he hit it with his other hand. He tried to get it off. The snake is gone, and when he looks up, the people of Malta have a shocked look on their face. They look anxious. They look worried. They look incredibly sad. And Paul says, what's wrong? And they say, that is the most venomous snake on our island. Every person we've ever known who was bit by that snake has died within a day. But Paul doesn't panic. I would have panicked. I hate snakes. One of my biggest fears. I would have panicked if I'd been bitten by a snake and told I was going to die within a day. Paul never panics. He doesn't freak out. Why? Because he has been promised by God he's going to preach in Rome. And he trusts in the promises of God. And he trusts that God is faithful to his promises. And an hour passes, and Paul is fine. Two hours pass, Paul is fine. A day passes, Paul is fine. He never gets sick, and he never has any ill effects from the snake. And about three days later, another ship comes by and rescues the people who have been shipwrecked on Malta. They all get on the boat, and Paul and all of them sail on to Rome. And in Rome, Paul gets to plead his case before Caesar. He gets to preach to the people of Rome. He's actually put on house arrest in Rome, and he spends the rest of his life in house arrest, writing letters to all of the churches that he has organized all over the world. And that's the end of the story. Friends, Paul was able to stay calm, to find peace in the midst of two terrifying and overwhelming situations because God had promised him he would preach in Rome. And Paul clung to that promise during the storm and when he was bit by a venomous snake. And friends, while the odds of God promising us that we will preach in Rome one day are pretty low, the Bible is full of promises God gives us that can help us in our lives. We all have times in our lives when things happen that cause us to be scared, angry, worried, sad, feel inadequate, empty, or any other number of emotions. Sometimes it's big, unexpected life events that cause these emotions within us. And sometimes it's a bunch of small things that all added together cause these emotions. Sometimes we may not even know why we are feeling these things. But when we experience these emotions, for whatever reason, I believe we, like Paul, can cling to the promises of God. God doesn't promise to always take away those things that are causing us to be scared, angry, worried, or sad. But God does give us so many promises that can help us in our lives. So this morning, I want to talk about four ways that we can interact with the promises of God that we find in the Bible. First, I believe we can interact with the promises of God by discovering and knowing the promises of God. This can be a little harder than you might think, though, to come to know the promises of God. As I was doing some research for this sermon, I decided to look up how many times in the Bible God makes a promise to a human, a group of people, or humanity as a whole. So I want to do that real quick. I want you all to, in your head, answer that question. Take a guess at what you think. How many times in the Bible does God make a promise to a human, a group of people, or humanity as a whole? You got it? All right. When I did that exercise, I guessed really, really low. There are about 7,500 promises of God to humanity in the Bible. And if we're trying to know the promises of God, friends, that can be a little bit overwhelming. So how do we come to know the promises of God? One way is by reading the Bible. With 7,500 promises throughout the Bible, any time we read the Bible, the odds are good that we will read or learn some of the promises of God. 
Another way that we can learn and discover the promises of God, and this may sound like weird advice coming from a pastor, we can Google it. If we enter promises of God into any search engine, we will find list after list of the promises of God. And if we're experiencing a particular emotion due to something happening in our life, we can type in such thing as promises of God when we're sad, or promises of God when we're scared, and so on, and so on. So the first way that I believe we can interact with the promises of God is by discovering and knowing the promises of God. The second way that I think we can interact with the promises of God is by memorizing some of them. As we are reading our Bibles or looking up the promises of God and we encounter a promise that resonates with us, that helps us feel peace or joy or love, we can write it down and memorize that promise. Throughout the year at our children's midweek meetup program, I have the children of our church memorize Bible verses. And many of the verses that I have them memorize are promises of God to them that I believe can help them throughout their lives. I believe that if we write down and memorize the promises of God that resonate with us, the Holy Spirit can remind us of those promises when life gets difficult or overwhelming, and that these promises can help us during those times. The third way that I believe we can interact with the promises of God is by praying the promises of God that resonate with us. Let me give you an example of what I mean. We all have times in our lives when we have to do something that we are scared to do or that we don't feel like we are ready to do. One of my favorite verses for those times is Joshua 1.9, which is on the wall of the children's worship space downstairs. Joshua 1.9 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more in a minute. But when I'm about to do something that scares me, I take that verse and I use it as a short prayer throughout my day. It might sound something like this. God, you are with me wherever I go. Help me not to be scared. Help me to be strong and courageous. And friends, we can pray prayers like this with any of the promises of God that resonate with us. And I believe that these prayers can help us find peace when life becomes difficult or overwhelming. And then finally, the fourth way that I believe we can interact with the promises of God is by surrounding ourselves with people who will remind us of the promises of God. When we are scared, sad, worried, or angry, it is often hard for us to remember to turn to God for help. In those times, it is so important that we have people around us who can remind us of the promises of God and encourage us to ask God for help. This might be a trusted friend, a spouse, or a family member, or it might be a common table, a Sunday school class, or another type of Christian small group. It might also be a therapist who knows that you are a Christian and who helps us process and better understand our emotions in conjunction with our relationship with God and God's promises. I've been reminded of God's promises many times in my life by individuals, small groups, and therapists when I was experiencing these types of emotions for any number of reasons, and it has been immensely helpful in my life. I firmly believe that surrounding ourselves with people who will remind us of the promises of God can help all of us in our lives. So friends, these are four ways that we can interact with the promises of God in our lives. But what does that look like in action? Let me give you an example from my life. When I was a freshman in college, I began to feel like God was calling me to ministry. I began to feel like God was calling me to work in a church. And when I heard that call from God and I began to feel that call from God, my immediate answer was absolutely not. God, you have the wrong person. I can't go into ministry. And I began to give God excuse after excuse after excuse as to why I should not be called into ministry. But the main reason that I gave God that I should not be called into ministry is because I was terrified of public speaking. I was terrified of speaking in front of people. Every time I had to speak in front of a group of adults or a group of my peers, my heart would begin to beat a little faster. I would break out into a cold sweat. My hands would begin to shake. I hated speaking in front of people. For my middle schoolers and high schoolers, this is not advice. This is not advice for you, don't don't do what I did. But when I was in high school, in 11th grade, I was in an English class. I had a 100 in that class in the last week of school, but we had one project left. And that last project was worth 10% of our grade, and it was to give a 15-minute presentation in front of the class. 
The day of that presentation came, I walked up to my teacher and I said, I'm not doing the presentation. And she said, what? And I said, I've got 100, it's 10%, I'll take the zero, I'll take a 90 in the class. I hated speaking in front of people. I despised it. And so I told God, I can't do it. I can't go into ministry. And I ran from that call to ministry all the way through high school. I mean, all the way through college, I'm sorry. All the way through college. And after college, if you can imagine this, I got a job working at a bank. I was a banker, and it was, it was not great. But I worked at a bank for about three years. And after three years at the bank, I was in a horrendous car accident. And that's a story or a sermon for another day. But I was in a really, really bad car accident. I was in the hospital for about three weeks. And after I left the hospital, the doctors told me that I needed to go basically on bed rest for three months as my body healed from this car wreck. And at the time that I was on bed rest, there was no such thing as Disney Plus or Netflix or Amazon Prime. That kind of ages me a little bit. But my options for watching TV during the day at that time were The Price is Right and some really horrible soap operas. So I spent a lot of those three months reading my Bible. I spent a lot of those months reading other Christian books. I spent a lot of time praying to God during that time. And over and over and over, certain promises came to me. Promises like Mark 13, 11 and Luke 12, 12 that say the Holy Spirit will speak through you and give you words to say when you speak to other people about God. Promises like Joshua 1, 9 that we just mentioned a minute ago and Matthew 28, 20, which say God will always be with you. You don't have to be afraid. And after spending time reading those promises and talking to God and reading my Bible during that time, I finally accepted a call to ministry. But if I'm honest, the prayer I prayed when I accepted that call to ministry sounded something like this. God, I still think you might have the wrong person. I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm tired of running. God, I put my faith and trust in you. And I'm going to hold you to these promises that you will be with me and you will give me words to say. Let's see what happens. I prayed that prayer almost 17 years ago and I've been in ministry of some kind ever since. My primary calling is to work with kids. I get to tell kids about God and how much God loves them. But over and over and over throughout those 17 years, I've found myself speaking in front of adults, whether it's preaching like I am today, leading a Bible study, talking to parents about children's ministry, talking to a committee. It's happened over and over and over more times than I can count. And friends, if I'm honest, that that stage fright, that fear of public speaking, it's never gone away. Every single time that I'm about to speak to a group of adults or a group of my peers, my stomach begins to churn. My heart starts to pound. But I always have to take a walk from wherever I'm standing or sitting to wherever I'm going to be speaking. And every single time when I take that walk in my head, I say a prayer that sounds something like this. God, thank you that you are always with me. Please speak through me and give me words to say. And every single time, As I begin to speak, the nerves and the fear begin to go away. Friends, God is faithful, and God keeps his promises. That's one of the many examples of how the promises of God have helped and continue to help me in my life. And I firmly believe that the promises of God can help all of us throughout many different circumstances and difficulties in our lives. Friends, as I close, I want to encourage all of us to spend time this week discovering the promises of God. Memorizing the promises of God that resonate with us, praying those promises of God, and finding ways to surround ourselves with people who can remind us of the promises of God. And as we do those things, my hope and prayer for all of us is that God will use the promises of God to help us both now and throughout our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in The Gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life-giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, 
and we look forward to seeing you soon.